Um, welcome everyone to another Lived Quality Conversation. Today, uh, my guest is uh, Stephen. I know Stephen uh, for a long time in many capacities. And uh, it's great to be able to talk again. We haven't spoken in a while, uh, but it's great to have you, yeah. Stephen. Uh, welcome to the podcast. No, thank you for having me. Um, I mean, when you reached out, I was excited. So, hmm. And when I listened to all your guests, I sort of felt like, I speaking to you know people who who speak complicated you know you know they they know, they are deep in you know in their in their jargon but it's always it's always a joy to talk to people especially down under across you know across the Rubicon like we'd say <laughs> yeah it's great it's great uh, the reason I'm really doing this whole podcasting experiment as I'm calling it right now is to. <laughs> just have a conversation with um i'm looking for people who rarely do this right (laughs) because i am one of those people who rarely does this so uh i'm looking for my mates uh who don't do this Mm. so we can also just do Mm. our own thing and see Mm -hmm. uh, how putting this conversation into uh the discourse uh can Mm -hmm. influence that and uh yeah because i i strongly believe that there's a lot of wise people around who have a lot of uh, cool things they are doing that never mm-hmm. get heard or get seen. Uh, and so, yes. and that's mostly because they, they haven't been reached out to or brought to, into the conversation. And I think uh, that extra step may help uh, some youngsters who are, you know, looking for inspiration or just influence the conversation that is going on mm-hmm. in the discourse. So that is where I'm yeah. coming from. Um, uh, but yeah, as, as tradition here on uh, Live Quality Conversations, I will, uh, tell them to reduce. you know, yeah. I- invite you to um, tell me uh, what, what is it that, uh, what has been on your mind of late and uh, mm-hmm. what's going on with you, what's alive for you. And uh, we'll mm-hmm. go from there. <laughs> Yeah, an interesting question, and I kept I kept thinking about this because you know it's uh uh so I've I I I'm in my mid forties, so I've started thinking a lot about life, about what life is and the legacy. I've I've been jokingly telling everybody I intend to live to to a hundred, right? But then one of my aunts, my favorite aunt, asked me, "So what are you going to do?" Why should you live to 100? What have you done to make you earn, you know, what are you doing that is valuable enough? And I'm a strong believer in uh, the universe and so on. So I'm starting to think about life and the footprints we live in the, they call it footprints we live in the sand. I prefer it not to be sand so that it's not washed away once we Mm -hmm. pass by, what legacy we leave in the people we touch. I'm thinking a lot about work. I recently changed jobs, I think. Uh, I'm now in the fintech space after eight years in the health space. You know, so everybody's asking me, so what made you decide, you know, to change that? And it was, again, driven around life, family, intentionality of uh, of some of, you know, like I'm trying to be an intentional father. It's very difficult work. Uh, I've got, you know, my four children now. The third is going to... Uh, secondary school on on uh, on Monday, you know, just three days away. So which essentially means I'm sort of turning into an empty nester. Yet I consider myself to be at the prime of my life. You know, I'm, I'm just starting to get, you know, almost getting to the tipping point because we are told now the tipping point is be- is between 45 to about 55. So that's the mm-hmm. decade at which you can achieve a lot. I, I'm thinking a lot about spirituality and religion. Um, interestingly, I, I have a, you know, I, my first two, I'm born Anglican. My wife is Catholic, turned Anglican. My first two daughters are Anglican. My two sons are Catholic. <laughs> they, and they were baptized last year because they seem to like <clears throat> rosaries and whatever is involved in that. And also getting in touch with my roots, you know, back to where we came from. What did our forefathers say? You know, they sort of, that sort of resonates a lot of the, looking at the world itself, you know, being a good person and figuring out like through all that, what would call 
you know, that those people were hard, they were tough and so on. But really, why were those things there? And mm. what are the lessons we can learn? Because most people th- try to throw culture under the bus. And because probably we don't understand why. We don't understand what was the reason, what was happening at the time that actually made those decisions necessary so that we could exist and we could survive and we could sort of thrive. I don't even look at, you know, I don't look at surviving. Surviving is so basic and so like Maslow's level one hierarchy of needs. We need to thrive, which sort of means that we go over and above looking for what we're going to eat tomorrow. So yeah, it's sort of like a, a time of my life where I'm sort of thinking I have reduced time, reduced energy, but I have like bigger ambitions than I did in my 20s, which are sort of more realistic. At the same time, looking at, you know, saying, okay, I'm becoming an empty empty nester, my career wise, where do I want to go? So it's sort of, I think, you know, it's one of those times where you're sort of like at a whirlpool and wondering like, am I in the storm? Am I in the eye of the storm? Am I, or is there, it's not peace and calm, but at the same time, I'm feeling excited about the opportunity. Mm, wow, uh, that's uh, that's a lot there to cover. I don't know if, if tonight is going to be enough. Uh, we're probably well, going to be going through this for a while. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I, and and, I, and and you know the, the the question is yeah is that is I don't think it's you can't have one track. I think we've we've reached a stage where it's a multi-track kind of thing. So. It's not just one thing. Everything you do sort of affects all the other aspects of your life. And, you know, work-life yes. balance doesn't exist. It's a pendulum that keeps swinging. Now it's probably either swinging slower or faster at certain... Like even its speed is no longer constant. It's just mm-hmm. the pace that it is. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, what is it, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, you, you have to run twice as fast to stay in the same spot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my favorite. Oh, oh, my favorite. I think Olivia Pope in Scandal, when her dad told us, told her, Olivia, Olivia, you're not one of them. You have to work twice as hard to get half as much. That has been yeah. my mantra for a long time. So I also look at like excellence and mastery of skills. So that essentially, you have to work twice as hard to get half as much until you reach the tipping point whereby, you know, you can work half and get four times as much. So I don't think. You know, you have to find, you have to keep doing the work, the 10,000 hour Robert Green rule, which, which Naval now says 10,000 iterations, which also makes sense because you can't, if you do the same thing for 10,000 hours, you never get good enough. So it's a balance between, are these conflicting schools of thought or are they, or is the message the same or is it much deeper than what we're actually saying, thinking? Yes, yes, and and it is indeed true, and and you know, like you've you've, you've touched on, uh, you know, talking about legacy, uh, life work balance, and and also getting into uh, a bit on spirituality and culture, and you know, as a person who also recently crossed into the forties, it's it all deeply resonates because I have also been very interested around uh, the same, you know, topics over the last you know, a few years, and uh, I have come to learn so much in that space that um, I did not know that's how it was before. And um, so, especially like recently, I was speaking to just last week, uh, there's a friend of mine based in Canada who runs a, a, he calls it, it's a Ugandan history uh, podcast, and on it he tries to cover the, he calls it those who came before us. And he tries to get into the origin stories of the different uh, cultural groups and uh, try to paint the picture of how things came to be uh, based off the available literature. And, and in, in conversation with him, we were wondering, um, like, you know, they would sometimes uh, in most of these places, they run what they call a, a book week uh, in schools. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Book club at book week during that week of uh, book week, you get um, children to go to school with their books, their favorite books, and dressed as uh, their favorite characters from those books. And so, we're wondering, 
uh, how is it that you know uh, we don't have our cultures represented uh, in that space? Uh, why is it that our kingdoms back home uh, are not, you know, investing in uh, bringing about, you know, popularizing the culture, updating it to catch up with uh, the tech revolution, and sort of like, you know. Why does my kingdom, I mean, I mean why does Munyoro <laughs> Kingdom not run a TikTok, right? <laughs> Talking about yeah. the, the, the ceremonies that they have in, in you know, in preparation. And, and, and as part of that, you know, while we're wandering through that, you know, we started to notice that there is, there is a gap there. There is a gap, which is an opportunity as well. But also, there's a possibility that, um, the, the technological advancement has probably left the people who are deeply rooted in the traditions uh, not able to keep up with it. And so they look at these things and go like, I don't really know what to do with that stuff. But then you have the youngsters who are losing touch with their identity and they are you know, trying to aspire to our modern stars, you know, trying to keep up with the Kardashians or whatever. <laughs> and, and in the process, uh, they, they try to become that, but they, if they work hard enough and try to get close, they realize it's not as meaningful as they thought it would be. And then they are left hanging yes. in this balance of uh, identity loss, identity crisis, and then you fall into yes. the mental health category, and then you're like, wait, actually, there's a, well, you got, you got rooted out of, you got rooted out. You, yeah, you got, what you need to connect to, anyway, I, I don't know, I'll give you back a bit, and uh, you, yeah. you work with that. No, that's, that's an interesting direction, because the, the, I think the, the stories we hear are written from, from the perspective of the victors, like your particular kingdom, Bunyoro, was offered a lot of resistance to the British rule. And thus it was decimated. And it is on purpose that Hoima, Bolisa, ETC were are actually not as developed because the aim was to write them out of history as part of the resistance. And I think it is, the British, I think, have done an excellent job of this, wherever you go whereby they erase existing history and replace it with their own version of that history. I mean, you find West African artifacts in European history museums. Why, why can't you take them back home when they were actually stolen? You know, so I think there is that. And I think it's a very... I would like to link it to mastery. You know, culture has a rigid set of rules. We only pick what we want. Right, I think that is the new modern age. Is that no? It's the indiv- I don't know what they call it. Individualism. You know, I am, I am, me, 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 and freedom. I want to be feel free to do this and so on. But what is freedom? Is ultimate freedom in everything? Are you really free when you actually have ignorance on your side? I mean, there are certain things that are we can't. There are cultural practices which were. Some are considered barbaric, some are whatever. I mean, we, there, there are some which are extreme, and today probably they don't fit because of we've gotten more knowledge and so on. But for those societies, they actually made sense. They work. So unless you looking from the outside into that society, you sort of don't... It, it, it's difficult for you to understand the context in which these rules were brought and so on. I mean, I, I will give you an example. My culture, I'm a Muganda by, by tribe. And then w- the most, my, my, most, my favorite question is asking people, what do, I de- what do you identify as first? Do, that gives you a sense of what the person's perspective is. And I tell people, if a person tells you I'm Catholic first, everything will be seen from a Catholic lens. Like for me, I'll tell you I'm a Muganda first which means I'm seeing it from that lens. And I, I usually used to think, hmm, why am I saying this? Like, do I believe it? And so on. But then when rubber hits the metal, we actually find that where do, where, what's my fallback position for decision-making? What's my fallback position for my values, for my morals, and everything? If I'm a Muganda first, it means I fall back 
my Ganda culture as a basis for decision making. Even in the modern age, now I may not expose that to everybody going around doing it, but it informs my decision making and the values I uphold. So I think, I don't think they are disconnected. I think they are tied, closely tied, because everybody wants to be like the Kardashians. But when you read them, they say a mother of four two girls with no talent turns them into a billion dollar, you know. Uh, you know, they've done their work. They've done what they have to do to succeed and survive in the world by, you know, by changing the face of reality TV. They, that's how they will succeed. That doesn't mean that's how I will succeed or how I want any of my children to succeed. In fact, I tell them, you know, you're going to school. There are three things I want from you. I steal from Jack Ma who says, I want my child in the top 30% because those people have time for other things. So I also, you know, I take that and say, I want you in the top third, top one third of the class. I want academic excellence. For me, that's my measure. Then I say, what else are you excellent at? Because those other areas of excellence are what gives you a stronghold in the world. Are you a good sportsman? Like I have my son going to Namibiango. I've told him, by the way, uh, sports excellence, I want. But then I also want you to listen and learn about the religion which is catholic you're new that's a catholic school so i want to hear what are you absorbing what are you doing what are you learning so it's not just one dimension i think many times we've tried to put everything in a single dimension in a multi-dimensional and multifaceted environment and space so that means that we have to go tunnel vision when actually i agree on focus but the baseline of that focus has to be a wide approach. And I, you know, I, we keep falling back. I keep telling people the village raises, the village raises the child. The child has a responsibility to come back to the village and pay back for all that opportunity and privilege that they got because of sacrifices some people made, whether you know it or don't. And you can always see it, you know, as like we said, we're getting children whose demands are getting higher and higher and you actually find they have no idea where these things came from. And when they look at your pay slip today and what you're able to do for them, they'll ask you like, how, how are you able to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, but yet it is a network of people that you're building. So I'm not saying the village is where you came from, but you have to build your own village of people who your own trusted village of people to help you raise the child because they will never, they will never, tell you everything. So you need, like, for me, I accept there'll be things my, my children cannot tell me. But then they better have aunties and uncles around them who are trusted, whom I also trust, to be able to make a call on this. And it was baked into our traditional religion, by the way. So my, for us boys, you'd have a singer who'd tell you about the ways of the world and how to understand women and how to deal with them. That singer was very... In fact, the Luganda saying is If you are not a woman, you'd have been my tata, my father, mm -hmm. one of my fathers, which essentially means her responsibility is actually to bridge that gap so that she provides masculine counsel. Even in our ceremonies, she's the one who is asked by the, your father, if you're a girl, like, uh-huh, have you vetted? And most people don't know their role, but they would go do a history check, what we call a background check on the families. Mm -hmm. Like, do they have any hereditary diseases? Do they have luck? You know, what is their kind of thing? Like, they will do the vetting of that. But by discarding that aspect, we also discard the background checks and knowledge, and now everything is sexualized. But really, a lot of their advice, and very good advice I've gotten, is from somebody who, who, who where our values align, and we understand each other at that wavelength. So I think... They're not mm -hmm. culture, and in work, they tell us network with your peers, give to open source. It's the same thing. Your open source community is the village, and you give back because it gives to you. In your work, try to up uphold people. You know, mm -hmm. wherever you go, I think the same values hold. Yes, yes, I completely agree with you, and uh, I, I have also experienced the same. Uh, though the, the spirit of the village uh, is sort of not as strong, uh, you know, as as you know, as would have it in Uganda, as as it is. I mean, it's stronger there than it is out here. 
because of the whole individualism. And so you, <laughs> you struggle. There's, there's, a, there's a saying here in Australia whereby uh, most people will tell you, oh, I don't hear anything. I don't know anything about my neighbors. They are really good neighbors. <laughs> It's like mm -hmm. a good neighbor has become someone you don't know. Like if, if oh. they can live next to you and be like a stranger, then they are considered to be really, really good, which is so unlike what, you know, we've grown up with back home, like you're describing. Um, the village raises the child and, and uh, everyone pitches in together. Uh, and, and to go back to a bit what you, you, you touched on earlier about the culture, <clears throat> as your basis, right, as, the, as the, the ground for your values and beliefs and becoming the lens through which you're seeing um, things and, and making choices of. And I think that is uh, very, 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 I find that to be very important because even, you know, speaking, uh, uh, you'd say philosophically, it's really, really important for you to be grounded. You must have... Um, something you stand for, right? And you, you <laughs> must have somewhere you, you, you're rooted in. If you don't have <laughs> somewhere, you can't be everywhere. And, and exactly. uh, this, is, this, is, this is part of the, the, the problem you're seeing these days, imagine where with the, the crises that are happening, where people, they don't have that grounding. And it doesn't mean, you know, like you're saying, like it doesn't mean that the, this ground is the best available option. It just means that this is my ground, right? It doesn't have to this be This is perfect. my, for me. <laughs> yeah, this is and, my and Exactly. It doesn't have to be perfect, <laughs> but mm. I mean, the Pareto principle applies. The 80-20 rule is that 80% mm. of the time, because there's nothing perfect, right? And I think it's that search for perfection, which, uh, what do you call it? Which drives a law. We want to be perfect. I mean, I, I tell people we are British. Our education is all British, which says bring the perfect answer. But I tell people, no, the Americans say as soon as I have something I understand, I will share. So I tell people, I am American in thought, but grounded in, you know, if I'm working in the British system, I figure out enough how to be nice, how to be good, how to be cordial. I tell people, I have to greet everybody when I go to the office. I spend 20, 30 minutes like going office by office, greeting everybody and say, good morning, how are you? Good morning, how are you doing? Like for me, how, how can't you say good morning? Whether it's the guard, whether it's, a, it doesn't matter. You know, anybody who, I say good morning. And like, you know, our traffic is terrible. Rather than trying to cut in, I, I sort of put up my hands and ask, can I, even if it's illegal, by the way, even if I am, but the mere fact that somebody has said, please, can I, knowing that they are doing something wrong, you you don't have road rage because, oh, if you do something and say, oh, I'm mm. sorry, or like when somebody allows you to pass, you, you sort of hoot and say, thank you. Like there are some very basic human social things that break the ice and say, good morning, how are mm. you doing? You know, uh, my name is Steven, what's your, like those are the things I'm trying to pick up and refine. Because I think they, you know, they play a lot. They play a lot in in what we do. Oh yes, they they do they do play a lot, and and I think they are the fabric. It's like um, the like real life happens in the in the mundane. Uh, th those tiny little things that we're always uh, doing. Um, in a recent conversation, um, you know, we're trying to understand how is it that. Uh, you, you, the boring is is what everybody <laughs> is trying to get to, uh, because when you mm -hmm. hear the things that people are striving for, it's like if you actually did those things, they're quite a bit boring. They're quite a bit repetitive. They're they're very routine. But that's where stability is, right? It's like that is that is the normal. I, I was chatting to a friend, and um, uh, I, they, they they had like a depression episode, and then they got put on antidepressants, and then they were able to to get back to the normal. And it's like, wait, so exactly. is this what normal life is like? And, it's, it's, and it's all about, like, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's all about the boring. If you can manage to, to adapt to the boring and, and uh, make it work, then you can see the freedom within it and what it allows you to do.
Exactly, and it, uh, actually, I even have a blog post. I think it's uh, it's th- it's five years now. I will share it with you, which says like boring in pursuit of fulfillment, right? Mm. It, because it, it essentially boring, and, and and that's the thing. It takes us to Brian Tracy's. Uh, it's like I have a lot of influences. Like Brian Tracy's eats the frog, right? It says find the biggest, ugliest frog and swallow it that morning. It means do the most boring, the most mundane, but most impactful task of that day, which leads into the one thing that what is the one thing that you can do now that makes everything irrelevant. That one thing, once you do it, everything else is irrelevant. Then you reprioritize, which then leads you into James Clear's Atomic Habits, which says build habits, but it says the way to ensure that these habits get done is to layer them. Like one habit leads to another, and so so that they are self-reinforcing, which essentially takes us back is that boring, I mean, it's like wealth. I think it's like the wealth of all riches uh, discussion. Somebody's driving a Range Rover, oh, that person is rich. Yes, but the wealthy people do not have to be driving a Range Rover. They may have the, they may say, this is where I'm going to put my time and effort in building generational wealth. And that generational wealth involves investing in your children, getting in them in the best, like trying to figure out this safety net that people will only see when they are 40 or 50. Mm-hmm. And they say, oh, by the way, my dad, like, I, I mean, my great, my grand, my maternal grandfather was a reverend canon. And everything we do in respect to church and things like that, or in the area he grew up in, we invoke his name. He passed over 30 years, 20 years ago. But imagine the impact he left, whereby his name can still open doors for his children. Like, that is amazing. That's what we want to be. And, you know, his, it is that, it's like the footprints you live in the, in the journey through life are that. You know, those are the things I'm, I mean, those are the things I'm thinking about. Those are the things I, I say, how else can I give back in within my own rules, in within my own circumstances, first to my children, that's my first one, then to the larger community, then through different people wherever I can, so that I can maximize my impact so that they don't have to even build upon it, but it's just me putting good out in the world so that others can grow and benefit from it. So it is essentially looking at it, it's, it's it, across all those things is that, what are the fundamentals? You know, am I a stoic? Am I a what? You know, if you read all those things, just saying, be a good person. Be a person of principle. Now, obviously, principle means principles are non-changeable, even if on, in two different circumstances, the same principle can give you different results or different answers. So principles don't mean that I die on a hill if the hill changes and is no longer viable, we move to another hill, but the principle should remain, they should be unchanging and unfathomable and, 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 you know, unchanging over time. And that, like I tell people, like one of my core principles, which I strive to be is excellence and mastery. Those two are in, those two are in, they're at loggerheads because mastery means I get very good at something. Excellence means I try to do the best I can. But that doesn't mean and quality. So I want very high quality work. But there are times when somebody says, I'm not willing to wait for that quality. I want a result today. Which means I should be able to deliver for today because by telling them I can't, then my mastery of my skills doesn't come out and my drive to excellence doesn't. Excellence is solving that person's problem today and when they need it. Because that's the definition of quality to a customer is if I want... If I'm hungry and I need something to drink, you can't tell me wait for an hour for me to give you that perfectly brewed cup of tea. Give me, wo- yeah. give me warm tea. I, I am thirsty now. You know, so I think it's that balance between all of them and trying to make a pragmatic and rational decision on you know, what, the, what those heels and those principles mean. Obviously, we don't know what they are and we think we know what they are, but as you keep testing them, they also evolve and say, okay, this one is, uh, some of them are vague, but you should be able to explain to them. And over time, we articulate them better or worse. Yes. Uh, and and mm-hmm. true, uh, you know, hearing you say that reminds me of uh, 
uh, you know, a, a conversation I had some time back uh, with this guy called Daniel from Ojiro's, uh, what we, you know, he coined the term, the apophatic walking stick, and mm-hmm. it's like AWS, but a different kind of AWS. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it, it's it's like a, exactly what you're describing, right? Like you, you, I was writing about something similar this morning. Uh, I had a conversation recently about uh, uh, the pursuit of purpose, and and it seems as though like the thing you're talking about is very much similar. The same. It's like you you have this goal that you know is drawing you, like you know where you're you're going, but it, for you to get there, you have to kind of like make your way through this, you know, jungle, which has a lot of meandering paths and obstacles. And, and you can still see where you're going, but, but there's, there's this whole set of things you have to walk through. And mm-hmm. you can't get through to the other side unless you walk through these things. And you're going to walk through these things one step at a time, step by step. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, that's one of the books I want to read is Dante's Inferno, the three books, because they talk about also changing into the kind of person who can mm-hmm. get to that destination. I think, you know, we separate, we tend to separate. Uh, Richard Branson says, if your dreams are too small, if your dreams don't scare you, they're too small. Mm-hmm. That sentence, what it sounds, what it sounds tricky, but the reality is this: you can't set a very high goal, keep working towards it, and you keep transforming into the kind of person who can achieve that goal. I think that's the other thing most people don't don't look towards, is that there is also change that's required from you as a person, so that you can actually achieve, and we're continuously changing. Uh, my other favorite books from Richard Green are The 48 Laws of Power and Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Like, you have to stay formless, which means you have to reinvent yourself so that you can become, you can keep morphing into a kind of person who can fit into the mold you want to see. Yeah, yeah, definitely, completely agree. And I think it's it's all being fooled by that by that view you have of of, uh, of that purpose, because then it keeps it it becomes your north, uh, you know, your north star. And your north star. You, yes. You're, yeah, while you're pivoting through all these. Uh, life struggles and trying to uh, keep in the here and the now and manage it, it's all still towards that objective. And and the better you get at that, which is the excellence and the mastery of, you, you are, uh, uh, you know, alluding to before, it, it sort of starts to get you into a flow. It's like you sort of uh, get comfortable with the stance that you now have become so well acquainted with um, the art of playing with your values and beliefs in alignment with your North Star such that you can take on whatever is coming at you uh, with so much ease because what must be done is always obvious to you, but that's because you're always meditating upon it. You're always fine-tuning your principles and your models to be better suited to the optimal... Uh, spot that you're working from, and uh, and uh, I, I I get part of this from John Vaveki's work, uh, Professor John Vaveki, uh, a Canadian philosopher who's done a, a great body of work around uh, you know navigating meaning crisis and uh, and cultivating wisdom, and it, it's very interesting because he talks about these uh, ways of knowing, and he says uh, when you you, you, you can, there are four main ways of knowing something, and it's like there's, it's it's a depth level, right? Like you you can know something uh, propositionally, whereby you know what a thing is, like by you know con, you know it's like a cut is a cut, you, you it's called this thing, it's a mm-hmm. cut. Um, but then uh, you can also know it um, what he calls uh, uh, procedurally, right? So. To go away from the cut, if I use the example of riding a bike, like if I show you a picture of a bike and you go like, okay, that's a bike, what happens? We know all the pro- the propositional facts about what a bike is. You know, it works this way, it has wheels, it has pedals, and it has a chain. Uh, but then 
the procedural knowledge you, you would get about a bike would be how to ride a bike. It's like actually getting on the bike and riding it. So no, reading about the bike and riding the bike are two different ways of knowing yes. the bike. Uh, but mm -hmm. then you can now know it a third way, which is the pers developing a perspective. Like once you've ridden a bike and cultivated the experience of riding a bike, now when you go to a meetup mm -hmm. where people are talking about riding bikes, you have some insights to share there, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you can also talk about, you know, when, when exactly. someone is conceptually explaining their bike chain broke, you understand what they are talking about and you can advise them through metaphor because you, you both have the same perspective you're referring to. Mm -hmm. But then there's a fourth and way of knowing. And experiences. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then he adds that there's the fourth way of uh, what he calls perspectival knowing. Um, no, sorry, participatory knowing whereby you decide to start a bike riders community where you people get together, celebrate bike riding, ride bikes together. It's like your lives are centered around this thing called bikes. It's like mm -hmm. when we come, when we talk about this community, it's like you're now talking about the different advancements that can be made to the improving of bikes, you know, and bike riding. It's like you understand mm -hmm. bike riding. It's like it's at a spiritual level. It's like you guys yes. worship bike riding. It's like people go to church. <laughs> You guys go to ride bikes, and you guys mm -hmm. are all okay. And so it's mm -hmm. like there's all those ways of knowing the depth of something. So, so when you when you get to know something in a participatory way, that is the most way you can you can know it. And that's why I think children a good example of this like they shortcut or they do it backwards. They start with the participation, they figure it out, then you can explain. The other things later, it's like, you know, the other send them later. to school, yeah, to learn the proposition, the history and all that. It's like, yeah, 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 but they already know what, what you know, walking is. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it gives us, I think, you know, what you've said has suddenly, you know, it also opens up is that we have, you know, I, 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 love, I love metaphors and I love proverbs and I love sayings, like stand on the shoulders of giants. But remember to feed the giant on whose shoulders you stand, which essentially means that if, if take for example, if I find joy in bike riding, I should share this joy with the world and find others who find the same joy and try to infect others with this joy, because mm -hmm. then it opens up, like you've said, it's, it's the highest, it's like, it's like Maslow's high, it's self-actualization is that it's no longer just about the bikes. It's no longer just, it, they're, they're integrated into a way of life. Now, that sort of means that you're pushing the envelope on, you know, you repair your bikes, you know good bikes and so on. And you can also be pragmatic about it and say, you know what, I, at the moment, I, I, it, it's a way of integrating, you know, you find friends. We do it with sports. I, I That's the other challenge with the world is that we do it in sports, we do it in games, but you can also do it on your individual so which sort of narrows your perspective and everything is centered around you and the achievements and your perspectives and so on without accepting alternate views. I mean, I'm one of those who I am learning how to listen more and so on. It's very hard, but I'm finding fulfillment in actually listening. At times, you know, I fall back, but it takes a lot of energy to actually listen to another person and hear their perspective. It is a lot of work that, you know, some people comes naturally, others fight to it, but it's one of those things you keep working towards and saying, how can I listen so that I'm not listening for the purpose of answering, but I'm listening for the purpose of understanding and trying to empathize and so on. I think that slowed down. I think a friend of mine, we were at a team retreat trying to get, you know, we're all remote and trying to get people into the office. And our pitch was like, when you come into the office, you get to talk to people. You may not be as efficient as you are at home, but you learn how to share rooms. At home, it's just you and your home office. And your the constraints are few. Here, the constraints are, you know, somebody's in the bathroom, so you have to wait at home. You probably have one in within your home office. So all that convenience leads you to have, to be short on anything that is not perfect or is not efficient. Mm. 
Yes, and and uh, wow, it's it, it, what you've just touched on there is very interesting. You reminded me of uh, uh, a phrase I like to use: um, listening with, uh, with with the heart, right? Like listening with the yes. heart. Hear, hearing for meaning. Um, mm-hmm. In a in a recent conversation, we we're talking about um, language, and uh, you know we we came to the conclusion that actually the language is a tool that is trying to point you uh, towards uh, an experience, like a, an experience that somebody is trying to point you to. So don't get stuck in the words because no exactly. one really, really uh, is trying to just say the definition. They're just using no. these. Oh, as, yes, uh, I listened to that one. It was a, an enjoyable one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was a very enjoyable yeah. one because it, 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 yeah. it also, I mean, it, it sort of says... It leads to, I mean, I think context. I think there's a book, uh, is it the cultural? I keep forgetting the name. We, we had to read it. Mm. Uh, whereby, you know, you have high context cultures like Japanese and so on, and low context cultures like American, where what I say is what I mean. There is no, like, there's no filtering. There is no what. It is what it is. And looking at those different contexts, language, even language evolves to, to suit that. I, I tell people I spell check my SMS messages, even when I have to send them, or even my WhatsApp messages, because I feel like I have to communicate clearly and so on. So it is, it is an interesting one because not just about the words. That's what I'm, I'm currently trying to guilt uh, everybody I'm with on conference calls. I put on my video. So you're seeing me. So it is a lot of work on my part because like it means I have to pay attention, but also means I'm present in within that conversation because it is very difficult for you to be distracted when your camera is on and you're looking there and everybody's paying attention to you because you're probably the only one. But that also gives you the moral authority later to actually ask somebody else, like, we haven't seen you in three weeks. Why don't you put on your camera? Like, mm. it allows you because you are consistent in that principle and so on. And the idea is we get a lot more context not from the words that are said, but from the interactions from your environment. And somebody can ask a question about your environment, and it, lead, it means they care. It means they're paying attention mm. rather than a set of numbers or letters on a screen. Yes, and, and it's, all, it's all part of that excellence, you know, we we're talking about earlier. It's, it's all part of trying to maintain uh, the cultivation of that excellence and raising up to, you know, those virtues because... Uh, as we attempt to do that, then mm-hmm. we become better. Then we, 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 we transcend the current, you know, less, uh, you'd say, less excellent version that we are and become, yes. uh, you know, a, a plus one version of us. I, I like to use yes. this uh, metaphor of, uh, they ask about the perfect people, right? I think you've heard about the perfect ones are not yet born, but... I, I, I think the perfect ones are the dead ones because then they can't improve. Like they've reached their they... final version. Um, <laughs> but if you're still alive, at least you can try again tomorrow and upgrade yourself a little bit. And, and with each day, you get the opportunity to upgrade yourself a little bit and become mm-hmm. you plus one. But once you die, that's it. Like that's, you're at <laughs> your final version and we shall put in as a monument in your grave and visit you because that's, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And, and, and it's also in pursuit of excellence. I mean, a friend of mine uh, introduced me to Kaizen, get better every day. The problem with getting better every day is people say that's too much work. But then James Clear says 0.1% every day. Like, oh, one, get better by 1% every day. It com- if you compound it, it's the long game, right? Everything we play is the long game. So if you compound it over time, it sort of means that if you compound 1% over a year, you end up with like 400. Or f- you, you end up with a high percentage. But by, that's the key. Mm. You also need consistency versus intensity. Is that it's better for you mm. to be consistent and show up and do this every day than showing up once a week and doing like five times because that consistency does, that intensity does not compound. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't compound. And, and compounding is the way you, you amplify it and make it bigger. It's like, for example, like if you take even this conversation we're having, it's like 
all the things we have touched on, we did not premeditate. It's like the no, no, it's, we did not. <laughs> <laughs> They've been exactly there in the background, and 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 mm-hmm. sort of uh, as as we're talking, we're sort of building this thing, which is, you know, we're all learning from, and 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 we're learning exactly. by taking part and adding to it, and uh, and sort of like going with it wherever it's going, and sort of like it has a spirit of its own that keeps drawing us, mm-hmm. and. And, and, you know, I say something and, you know, it reminds you of something which then you, you, you pick Trigger up. Triggers something and else. And then, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, yeah, so I think it, it's all, you know, like we're touching before, it's all about uh, the relational aspect, like maintaining that and fine-tuning, getting closer to the reality, being closer, at least as accurate as you can be. Of course, you're not going to because the reality is also moving. <laughs> And, it's changing, and, you, and the only thing that's yeah. constant is change, and also yeah. the reality moves. And maybe that's the other thing is one. I also I encourage people you need to conform as much as possible. Mm. That's one. Mm. But I also tell them there's also power in non-conformance. Is if there sometimes you have to follow the herd so that you're not ostracized, but in following the herd, that doesn't mean that you have to do everything the herd does. So it is finding a balance between what's socially acceptable and wh- or what is acceptable by the community based on your values and principles. And some of the things you may have, because we, we're not, we're not, we don't have a single facet. So if you're multifaceted mm-hmm. and the only way you can achieve things is you can't know a person a hundred percent. So what you do is in each facet, make sure that you're showing them that aspect of you, which one, they can relate to, they can deal with. Because at times it may mean you not, you may not have to expose all of yourself. Now, somebody will say, yeah, but that's not authentic. I'll say, so what is authenticity? What is vulnerability? Why would you say something when in the community where you're at, it, it is going to, you're going to be ostracized for that? So I think the idea is also being able to get some level of control over your own personal needs and wants because i think uh, i don't know who says it, who said it that a person who cannot who fails to control their desires is actually lost because mm. if you can't control your desires the delayed gratification playing the long game it essentially means that you're not in control because you cannot control your core desires and so on mm. yeah. so controlling them I- and also being able to do what is right and appropriate in the community of people you're in is very important. But at the same time, you must ensure that you're still consistent with your principles and values, which I believe should be your non-changing. Like your principles Mm -hmm. and your values should be sort of immovable or they should be sort of stuck because they are your anchors in whatever tide you're flowing in. However, you must be willing at times to push on those and say, but maintain, I think I I like... uh, I've been listening to manliness podcasts and that age post. I, I listen to the, the art of manliness and order of man and that age podcasts. And they talk about manliness. They keep bringing all these different people, but you find multiple perspectives whereby you're talking about sovereignty. Like I must be able to make my, I must have a basis for me to be sovereign. I must have, I must be able to provide, preside, and protect my family. If I can't do those things, and they all build on each other, because when you provide over your family, when you provide for your family, then you have, it means you can grow to protect it, then you can preside over it. Like, Mm. you know, that means you're sovereign, which means you can maintain integrity. And provision doesn't mean you have to give your children what everybody else has. If everybody else is buying $400 Nike, or, or Jordans or some sneakers that have come out, you must instill values in your children whereby you say, okay, those ones are out. If you want them, you're going to have to work for them, right? There's this, you, you must use that as a way of instilling value, but we're not saying they should be, they should have nothing or they should have everything, but we should find a balance whereby mm. one they learn you have, you know, we, we have this discussion in my household is that, you're only entitled to a bed, food, at least the basic meals, that's shelter, like, and, and me to pay your school fees. 
everything else, like those five necessary human rights, right? But everything else is a privilege that I and your mother give to you, and they can be withdrawn at any time. You're not entitled to a, you're not entitled to a phone. You're not entitled to watch TV. You're not entitled to internet. It's something you work for. So the way you pay us back is be excellent at school, deliver good grades. When you're home, be good to your siblings, and do your fair mm -hmm. share of your chores. I'm not gonna pay you for chores, but I still I pay for them in other ways. I may not pay you directly, but mm -hmm. That's where your shopping budget is and so on. And that's where all these extra things come from because you've earned them. So we're trying to also build that, push that, that mantra is that you have to earn these things. And in life, everything is earned. Either it's inherited, whereby it's earned by virtue of your standing in society and so on, or you have to work hard for it. And the key is the harder you work, I think somebody said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. True, because luck is when opportunity meets uh, preparation. So you must make sure that that happens so often because you've put in the hours and now you're riding on it. But that doesn't mean you stay still. I think, you know, that's also the other drive. Like passive income is not passive at all. Like everybody's talking about, oh, have this passive income, but it's not passive because you have to keep an eye. Like you can't say I'm in investing in stocks and bonds and so on. And you're not keeping an eye on where on the direction the bonds are going. What happens if they get wiped out? You know, there's yeah. work that has to be done. Probably not as much, but you know, the you you sort of have to spend like you you can't, like you said, you can't stay still because when you stay still, the world is moving, so it will leave you behind. So you and you have to do a lot more than just maintain the minimum trajectory in life. You sort of have to go over and above. So that at least you know, you have some buffer, you know, if, yes. if you have a bad day or if you have a shock, you don't go into the red totally. Like life doesn't like eat you up and spit you out, but rather you have some kind of buffer whereby you can go through that. You have a support system that can help you get back on your feet. And that is the measure of a good life. I think that is the measure of people who are willing to go the extra mile for you to support you that's your investment. Like they say, it's, a, it's, a, it's an account you just keep depositing into and you don't have to, take it, you don't have to withdraw from it. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, you, you've touched on quite a few things there. What, one thing that is really sticking up in my mind is that um, the, the idea of redundancy, of building enough redundancies, right? I'm reminded of, uh, you know, the, the seat belts of a car, right? The airbags. You know, all these extra components that you pay for and you wish never to be using. Like, like you don't want to be in a situation where your airbags are working. But you also don't want to be in a car without airbags because Airbag. exactly. if, you, if you need them and they are not there, then, exactly. you know, they, 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 it, it's a fatality. Uh, and so mm -hmm. we need to always, like, really, really invest in uh, building those redundancies because then they become the safety net. And, and usually a lot of work that goes into building these redundancies is, is probably not appreciated. It's not acknowledged. It's, not, it's unseen work. It's, it's hidden under the surface. But it's in the, the thing you're saying before, like, you know, slowing down to sort of like pay attention to the detail, like greeting people, right? Like having uh, those conversations, um, being vulnerable when you need to be, right? Pay, paying attention to the meaning of the situation, trying to, trying to stay in the optimal spot of the context that is ever shifting around you, so that you are shifting with it. It's a, it's a. The, the the moment you start to pay attention to that, you start to realize how what would look like boring is not as boring as it looks. Like how quickly exactly. things are moving, how quickly things are shifting. And so then all of a sudden, uh, you notice how much work must be done to even have some kind of stability because uh, stability is a privilege, right? <laughs> stability is exactly. A privilege. It, it, and it's earned and work for every yeah. day. It's <clears throat> like rent. Yeah. It is due every day. Yeah. And, and, and maybe, I, you know, sort of what you had touched is, is the comfort zone is where dreams go to die. I think we don't want to be too uncomfortable, but, you know, people say, oh, I hate my job. There's no opportunity. I ask them, what are you driving to excellence? What, 
are you doing? Of, I mean, I think run the day or the day will run you. And I keep, I keep telling everybody, like, take charge. And someone says, but how do I take charge when I have no power? I say power is earned and taken. It's not given. Nobody's going to give you any power, even if they want to, because they have, you know, you're not worth it. You have to show them that you're worthy of that investment of time and energy and resources such that they can give it to you. But, you know, and also you, when you get in a position of power, support others. That is, that is power that is unseen because then you become the more you support others, a uh, rising tide that raises all ships, that tide, when it doesn't come, all the ships know. <laughs> yeah. You know, and people will look out, like they say, get your name mentioned in rooms where you're not, but nobody's going to mention your name in a room unless you've done, unless you're excellent, unless you're pushing the bar, unless you're pushing the envelope. And someone say, yeah, but I do all this stuff, but I never get mentioned. Then we ask you, what are you doing to get mentioned? Like, even that attention, nobody's going to do it. It's not like, because most people say, oh, my boss is not, you know, giving me the airtime and so on. But what I, what are their challenges? Are you empathizing upwards? Like, one of my mm. friends sort of said this to me a couple of years ago, is you have only one job, is to manage your boss's expectations. That's it. You have to understand their challenges. You have to understand their needs. Because they are the ones providing direction for the work you do. Once you get into that mode, it means that you have to do more than just like, you know, people want a job description, like tell me what I have to do. I say, yeah, do that. But that's just the starting point. Create opportunities for yourself, create opportunities for others, create opportunities for your team and your organization, because you never know when mm. that opportunity, I know everything is going to like turn out today, tomorrow. No, at times, you know, you know, the, the, what do you call it? The, the the bamboo tree like for, it grows like five feet in like five years. Then in the next five years it grows fifty feet. That is true in life. And I keep I keep using my own life story as an example of that. I spent I think uh, I started working when I was in my Essex vacation all through university. But when I left university I started work. So I sort of ran my own business first before going into employment. But we spent about 10 years. It was hard work. It was the grind. And my business partner always said, focus, Stephen, focus on this. We're doing all this stuff. But I can tell you yeah. that 11, maybe 15 years investment, I am still reaping from that because even up to today, a lot of the things I'm doing is, is based on that foundation I had because I had focus. I was determined to become the best. And that drive I still have. I may be older and slower, but I keep telling my, like the team I work in, I'm, I'm sort of the generalist. Everybody's a specialist. I have a great mm -hmm. time because every time I talk to somebody, they have their own specialist perspective. But I, the generalist, know enough such that we can have a decent conversation and, you know, that kind of thing, because I am what I am. And I also, I think we also, like you said, discover your purpose, but also discover what you're good at, what you enjoy and what makes you happy. Like I, yeah. for me, tech is my thing. I keep telling people I've been like writing code for 20, like 26 plus years. I think it will be 28, 28 this year. I'm planning to write for another 30. And they tell me now, how will you be relevant? I have to learn new languages. I have to use my old tech. I tell them, by the way, there are still sites which have COBOL and Fortran. So Python is going to be here. PHP is going to be here. Like those languages will be here. Or there'll be somebody who will say, can you help us work with our team of developers to understand and solve problems and things like that? So it is, it is that is whatever experience and skills you may have, they're not necessarily wasted, but you still have to for an opportunity for excellence, an opportunity for growing. And like one of my colleagues mentioned, we have unlimited opportunity, but limited resources. Therefore, your constraint has nothing to do with opportunity. When people say, no, I'm not getting an opportunity, I tell them, everywhere you sit, there is unlimited opportunity. Mm. But the resources, which is time, energy, skills, you know, bandwidth to deal with these things is what is limited because only then can you actually take advantage of those things. Yes, because you, you have to sort of find a way uh, to become creative 
with all of these pieces, right? You, 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 you know, you, you hear a lot of uh, people say, and you, you touched on it earlier, you know, you ask people, why, why are you not doing this? How, why are you not prioritizing uh, excellence cultivation? I, say, I can't, I don't have time. But mm-hmm. nobody's going to give you the time. You actually have to make the time first, like find a way to create time then mm-hmm. after you've created the time, then now use the time in a way that is aligned to the things that you want to use it for. And mm-hmm. um, before you know it, it's like, um, I, I was describing this, we have a small book club, and I think we're doing uh, the Daily Stoic, and, and we're talking about um, a good day, right? It's like, what is a good day? And, and how do you uh, cultivate... A good day and, and and it goes into a bit of a detail because you sort of have to maintain this level of awareness like of what actually happens in your day you have to really know your days and and always aim to improve them and it's not like just there as a concept it's more like my mondays what are my mondays like how how mm-hmm. am i fine-tuning my mondays to become a person who has excellent mondays right and then mm-hmm. then you go to your tuesdays but then that means you have to start fixing some parts of these days. It's like, oh, wait, I have this this block of time between this time and this time. It's it's always like I'm preparing children to drop them off to school. Uh, so therefore, that is the only activity that happens during that time. And I, every time that time is arriving, if I'm in the middle of something, then I have to drop that because it, there's a priority rising. It's like the, the peak mm-hmm. hour has, has mm-hmm. arrived. And then you have the bedtime in the evening. It's like, okay, you know, we have to start preparing to arrive at that bedtime early enough. So that means dinner has to start at this time. Then these other things in between have to happen. And then bedtime happens uh, on time. Because if I don't do that, then uh, I'll probably not have my other two hours after these people go to sleep so that I can do other things. Um, yes. It, it, there's a knock-on effect if you don't curate your day to try and have mm-hmm. a good day. Uh but on the other hand, you could look at it and go like, oh, you know, I just, I just roll with the flow, right? I and, just roll with you, the flow. Yeah, you, you can roll with the flow if you want. And it works, <laughs> right? Yeah, and it works, yeah. but it, it has its side effect as well. Like, yes. too, too much uh, unlimited uh, freedom all of a sudden limits you in, in its own way. They, they did this experiment where they, they took children and uh, they put them in a field. It was a big field, like, you know, several acres big. And they told them to play. And the children did not leave. Like, they just stayed in the spot where they, they put them because it was too broad for them to com- to figure out the edges of where the playground mm-hmm. stops. Then they, they yes. ran another control group. They put a boundary around them. And then all of a sudden, the children started to play because now they knew where the environment stops. Uh, it, it, they could figure that out. So it's like once you know your limits, then you know where you can play, right? Uh, without mm-hmm. knowing those limits, uh, you, you're, you're going to be doing everything, but actually not doing anything. And so anything, yes, yeah, because the limits and it also comes to order. Ideas. Exactly, yeah, it, it comes yeah. to order and schedule. So, but it's also a mindset. I think uh, most people say I hate Mondays. So we have Monday blues, it's even a mental condition. I used to be the same until I decided Monday is my first favorite day of the week. To me now, and I and I, I I went in and coached myself, and I keep telling people I love Mondays. It's my first chance. I looked for a reason for actually having an awesome Monday. Say it's my first chance to be awesome in the week, so I cannot let it go to waste. So one, it's a mindset. I am saying Monday is my, and I even, my team is infected, happy Monday, I have energy, and so on. It doesn't matter what happened on Sunday, which means my Sundays have to be reconfigured so that I have a great Monday. You know, there's there's the reverse, right? But also, I think people want, we as humans, we are perfections. We want all or nothing. As someone say, I don't have time, and they say, do you have 30 minutes a day? That's the problem. You know, we all want intensity over long periods of planned time. I mean, it's it's the atomic habits, you know, just have a small habit. Do it for 30 minutes a day. And once you do it for 30 minutes a day for 
90 days for is it 30, 45 days, it becomes a habit. Once it becomes a habit, layer something else over it because then you can do that. There are people with constraints, like you've said, bedtime, children, etc. I also keep telling people like constraints are awesome because they are, like you said, the children in the in the field, they are actually points at which you say these are non-negotiable. And even your business, even your company etc., can accept even your team people are humans they they can sort of say this person has this constraint so how can we support them but that means you also have to earn that trust which means you know most people say i want to sleep in late but i i like i want to have the best life but not put in the work you know so you sort of have to do the same i you know i tell, i stay i stay my my commute is about 70 minutes into the city when i have to go into the city that means the days I go into the city, I must ensure there is value for me going into the city. At times it's uh, because my wife does, you know, she's more flexible. So she does the commute into the city. And then there are days when she doesn't have to go. So I'm, I always try to figure out for the days that she doesn't have to go. Are those the days where I can put these things that require me to go into the city? Which has a double, which has a double whammy effect in that. She's happy. She's not going on the days she doesn't have anything to do. But also, I mean, when I go, there is value to me having to go to the city, and it is tied in with a whole host of other things. So that it's not just... So I think we always... We don't take the time to move things... It's not perfection, right? There's a bit of compromise, but you can also figure out a compromise that is a win-win-win situation. I think, you know, it's either, it's either this or that. And many times you actually find that this win-win doesn't work. Like this win, so that others, sorry, win that others lose doesn't work. We can all win. And if you have that attitude, it means you're looking for ways and there has to be some pain, right? That's the key. The, the question is, is it pain you can fathom or is it pain you can deal with? Like you, you have to, like you cannot have, like you said, you cannot have a completely free life full of pain and so on. Struggle is what, I mean, even muscles, even if you do sports and fitness, anytime you push the envelope, you're uncomfortable, you will have to push again at something. So I think it's also that thing of people expecting to live carefree lives, watching Netflix all day, eating all you want on a couch. Yeah, you can do it for like one, two days, but after a while, your brain starts going atrophying. So for me, who loves TV, I say, Friday night is my binge night. Like uh, I think Mark Twain said, never trust a man without a vice. I have my own vices, but I structure them very well and say, Friday night, I come home. If I have nothing to do on Saturday that requires my brain to be sharp, I am going to binge and sleep at 4 a.m. I will watch five hours of TV, compress all the TV I have I wanted in the week. But I'll also feel happy in that I have indulged. Mm. And, you and know, I, think, I have indulged. Yeah. And, and then that doesn't make it so bad. So even if I miss three weeks of binge nights, it is generally okay because there's, and there's no way I could, like, if I look at it practically, there's no way I could fit it in. But I think people want no pain. They want no compromises on whatever schedule they've put in their mind. You know, I tell them, I tell people, may I love being an employee? They say, but what? Eight to five bosses. I tell them, guys, you've not worked for yourself. That slave master is the worst. You don't work eight to five. And some people say, I gave up my eight to five so that I could work from seven to 10 p.m. with half the pay. <laughs> Not all of us are meant to wow. be entrepreneurs and business owners. But when, when you're working for yourself, when you don't work, you don't eat. And any, you know, as an employee, I have time off. Like yesterday was a public holiday. I have time off. I have weekends off. You know, I can you know, there are schedules once in a while I get in call, you know, I, you know, I have to do something after seven, but overall it's eight to five. So I, which means I have to maximize what I do in that eight to five. But at times I add more hours because I have to be competitive in my organization. I have to drive value. I have to do research. I've made it my life so that I am excellent, so that I can push that envelope, which later will free up time probably, but which will later, but if I find joy in the work that I do, I think that's the other thing many people don't want to do. You say, but my work mm. is grant work. I have so many tickets, but where's the joy? You, if you let, if you let decisions be made for you, the day will run you. But what can you do to flip that around? It may take you six months 
to earn the trust. But you must, you know, you must push that envelope so that people are willing to give you an opportunity. You know, everybody, you know, everybody is, everybody wants to give others an opportunity. I mean, there may be a few who don't, but overall, everybody wants others to get better. Yeah. You know, so, but and you have to earn it. Like, yeah, I mean, where am I? Because I mean, if you're going to invest time, resources, energy, and that opportunity you're going to get is at the expense of something else. So how do you make it that it's valuable enough that somebody is willing to put off that something else for you? Everything's an opportunity yeah. cost. Somebody, you know, there's an opportunity cost, not a win-lose, but an opportunity cost. So how do you make sure that the value you're giving, like when somebody weighs, they say, ah, ah, you know, working with Clayton is more important than me going for this thing I would enjoy or something of the sort it's an opportunity cost and you figure out but this you know this could be exciting this could be interesting you know why not try that yeah I, and and i agree with that i think it, it it all lines up with uh you know still referring to Vaveke's work he, he calls that the you know having a sense for relevance realization uh it's <laughs> like you have to track relevance um uh there, there's always something relevant to what you're doing and when you align with your relevance then you're mm-hmm. you're continuously improving um you know the optimal engagement of whatever it is you're engaging in so you you, you close you, you you slowly get closer to the optimal spot where you need to be um mm-hmm. but for you to do that you have to have that sensibility for the relevance and you have to always be updating you know, your relevance realization engine, if I may call it that. And, and I think that's mm-hmm. what you're, you're touching on there. It's like that, that balancing, that knowing uh, how, where do I need to be? Uh, when do I need to be there? And how do I need to be there? So that, uh, you know, there's a knock-on effect that keeps pushing me towards where I want to be and keep going. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so the... There's a lot of background work that has to go into that. That is sort of, um, you know, part of it is coming up from all the experience, right? Like trying this again, trying this again. Exactly. It's like if you like start watching, probably when I start publishing these recordings, you start to see that, oh, this was the first one. This is when he, <laughs> this is when I first tried, right? And, mm-hmm. and then there was a, a, a continuous change with each version that I made because with each one, I learned something with each with each setup yes. that I tried, so something new emerged. With, with each with each guest that I was talking to, there was a new uh, wave of, of, of knowledge and, and, and insights that came up that now I use to improve uh, the next set. So it is really, really important to, ha- to maintain that awareness and always be forward-looking and open and sensitive to that which is going to be relevant and what you need to work with so that you can move this story forward because the story has to keep moving forward. Has to keep. Yeah. And, 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 and I say it's also, it's also great, right? If you look at the amount of time in actually getting the guests, having a podcast, um, editing it, uh, you know, it is, if you look at that total investment, if somebody told you how much time it takes, you'd never start. But the key is you start, you do, you evolve and so on. And, over time, nobody says you have you have to have like five a week. You do them and just make sure there's a cadence that you know is expected. And once it works, after a while, it, you hit the tipping point and it sort of works on its own uh, to create you know this this rolling. And then you start finding fulfillment, and then you start bringing in you know you start bringing in other people, your wife, your children, you know, you start teaching them skills and maybe get one of your kids to start. I know a lot of the podcast uh, guests I hear, like my child works in this part, in this aspect and things like that. You know, even me, like we've got goats at home, we've got, and so on. My boys do the vet stuff and they say, yeah, but Stephen, don't you trust them? I say, yeah. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? All the goats could die. That, that, that's like the total worst, but I'm not going to struggle. Let them try. Let them now, even when they ask the vet question, like what's this medicine? Because they know they have, they're, they're going to come back and answer the same. Why are we giving it? When are you going to give it again? Have you logged in the goat book that we've done this? When, when do you come back? 
because they know I'm going to ask them those same questions. So to them, they're asking these questions in anticipation of what their dad will ask them. What they don't know is the subliminal training is that I have to collect as much information. Like when they go to work for a boss, they will anticipate that this guy is like my, this person's like my father. So mm. I have to ask these questions that have this information and it will just work out like that. But they, they have responsibility and each of them has one in there. So it's not like, ah, oh, these are daddy's things. No, I have mine in there. So if mine dies, I will feel the pain, you know? So there is also that sense of responsibility by integrating them into the system. And I trust them with it. Now you'd say, yeah, it could be better. You could optimize and make it more efficient. I say, yes, I could. But then I would lose the, that learning aspect, that lack of pressure. I think, you know, uh, I love uh, 37 Signals uh, as a company. They have a lot of this like alternative thing. And they say, we don't have to maximize the amount of profit we make on each client or on each product because the essence of profit maximization loses you freedom because you're trying to maximize. It's okay to leave some money on the table. Why? Mm. Because that, that like, like you say, you know, you're, you're sort of trying to hit the top of Pareto's principle, the 80% rule, because the last 20% is a lot of work. So let's leave the 20, let's ignore the 20% because we've collected enough. And then let's have some fun because the last 20% is no fun at all. Really? Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and it brings me to the, you know, that, that reminds me of the good enough principle. It's like you have to, it, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be good enough. You have to start mm -hmm. to start to know what it takes to make something good enough and what that good enough is. And, and you, you, you know, it is the 80%. It's like most, mm. of, most of the good enough things, they're, you know, a bit slow and, and, and they, they don't stick out, but they work mm -hmm. consistently. And I think mm -hmm. that is the same thing we were touching on earlier about the boring, about the mundane, about, you know, stability yes. and uh, sort of grounding things. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. And you must, you, ensure that you're good, you, you must ensure that your good enough is such high quality also because good enough doesn't mean shoddy work. I think yeah. that's the difference between... I, I keep telling people like Apple, they don't have the fastest processors. They don't have anything. It's like two, three years behind the curve, but it's a lifestyle, you know? So good enough doesn't also mean poor quality. I think the bar for good enough has to be, this is good enough, but it's such high quality that the competitive, it's a moat. I like the concept of moats. It's a moat around our business because we do good enough for us, but it has to be such high quality, such an excellent effort in the eyes of our customers and our communities that essentially, you know, they are blown away by our good enough. Mm, mm. Yeah. Knowing that you, you, you gave the best that you could, uh, like, like you squeezed out the most juice from this that you had, and that is the best you could get. Uh, exactly in, in that essence yeah it is good enough in that i have not broken my back like i've not like i'm not injuring myself it's like when we do you know sports and so on they say you need to warm up don't go too fast like you i'm just at i'm just below those limits that i could hurt and injure myself but it it gets the job done it's above it's above the minimum it's way better mm -hmm. than i have to ensure that that bar for good enough i think because most people assume good enough, MVP, fast pass has to be shoddy. But what we keep saying is no, good enough, even base camp, you know, they, they sort of allude to it. Like MVP is not uh, a fast version. It doesn't have to be crippled. It has to solve a particular problem and do it so well, but it should still be just good enough. That's a measure of good enough. Yeah. And, and as, long as, as long as it's working, achieving its objective, uh, you know, and, and without, with, with minimal waste, I would put it, like with minimal waste. Well, I, 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 I think waste is an interesting one because innovation comes from waste. So I, I, I think we, I, I mean, we also look at it on finance, right? They tell us, oh, what, to finance, you have to be frugal. It is, I tell people, yes, you do. But target two things, manage your expenses, 
by manage, I'm not saying minimize. Manage means like you should eat healthy food. You should have a good life, right? You can't say I'm going to get like just the bare minimum internet quality I need. No, get good enough so that, you know, it's, it's manage, not minimize, but then increase your earning potential, which is invest in mastery. So I think the minimization of waste is a challenge that we have is that the moment you, I'm not saying waste, right? I, I, I don't know if I'm making sense. Like minimization is a scarcity mindset, in my mm, opinion. Mm, mm. It's saying that we don't have enough. Yeah. Management is an abundance mindset. It means when the seven years of lean, of, you know, in the Bible, it says seven years of, seven years of plenty followed by seven years of lean. It means that in the years of plenty, you store the excess so that when the lean comes, you have where to start from. I'm not going to, it's not completely enough, but you will still do the work. So I think even the mindsets themselves, I believe in minimization is a scarcity mindset. Management is, responsible management is an abundance mindset. Like just because, mm. you know, and at times it's about being creative about certain things rather than like people say, oh, cut out Starbucks. If you save like five, six dollars on Starbucks, that's like $1,800 a month and so on. But some people, Starbucks is, I used to drink coffee and I used to drink my, and then, you know, at that time I said, but Stephen, I, I'm just spending too much money on coffee. I know that it's mm. not about the coffee. It's the fact that it signals to me that my day has begun. Yeah. It is a, it is a ritual. Obviously, you don't want like too expensive rituals. But when I went off coffee, my income didn't change. It is, it, it, but at that time, that's the ritual I needed. So I think mm. I, 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 I hear you about minimization, but I think mm. we need to move into management of these things, which at times is creative. Somebody may say, okay, um, I need to cut my bills. It is, why are you cutting bills? Like you, you can't drink less water. You can't drink dirty water just because you're trying to save money. The easier way is why don't you make more money? How can you make more money? Take a course in six months so that you get that promotion you need. That is a mm-hmm. better way, but hold your expenses. And you need to pay for the gym because you need to be healthy. You cut out gym in five years, you'll be paying your health bill or health premium insurance premiums will go higher. So I think yeah. it's, it's less about minimization per se, but more about management. Yeah. And so like for me, like I say, like, you know, we all gas up when we commute, right? People always gas up till, you know, they use the car, the tank till zero. But if you reach halfway and top up, apparently there's a myth that you use less fuel. I don't know how true it is, but when you're halfway... I would believe because it vaporizes, you know, if it's empty. So you sort of keep it, when you reach half, you top up. Then you can also structure this top up such that it is, there's a petrol station you use, there's a gas station you use, it is on a specific route, based on a specific activity. And so like, I can optimize some of these things by just doing them regularly. If I have to do it Mm. once a week, when I go to do shopping, I use, like I can do these things. Or do I get a card that gives me, you know, that gives me points that I can use to pay at the petrol, at the fuel state. Like it allows you to do those things that enable you to manage these costs or have some benefits that spill mm. over into other areas. So it forces you to be creative rather than, you know, I, I am, I am with you in that we shouldn't like spend, but I think the mindset is I need to control these things, but I also know what's yeah. necessary. Yeah. I think yeah, if we push yeah, too much I'm, for I'm, minimization. I'm, yeah. Yeah. No, and, and I didn't mean it in that way. Uh, I, I meant okay. that uh, we we do um, we do have to like eliminating waste is mm-hmm. how we we build uh, the compounding effect. I'll give you an example. Um, so similarly, like you know, even as we 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 did struggle to try and uh, figure out, like I'm not good with the let's say the saving culture it's like oh I, I have to put aside this amount of money consistently that model does not work for me however hmm. i realized that uh there was a lot of waste happening like mm-hmm. we would uh, uh, go grocery shopping and you find all these sales and you think you're saving money because things are on sale 
And so you buy mm-hmm. a whole bunch of things, um, and then you bring them home, and then uh, a week later or a couple of weeks later, things are going bad that that you sort of like bought initially in bulk, and then you have to chuck mm-hmm. them away. And so you're losing yes. uh, th- that investment. Yes. And so yes. to optimize this, um, I ran an experiment at home whereby I got, uh, I became sort of like the, 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 the pantry and fridge cop in a way that uh-huh. I, I was sort of like trying to notice how we're using those items. Uh-huh. And I started to notice that uh, everyone had a preference uh, at home. And so I started to notice everybody's preference. Oh, so-and-so likes this. Every, every time they come, they, they pick a lot of this. And that thing never gets wasted. It always gets consumed. So I yes. identified all the things that were always being consumed to completion and which things yes. would go to waste. And so then we came up with this new list whereby we know people's favorites. So now we only yes. invest in the favorites. So it's, it's not about... Uh, exactly. Like, That's management, it's actually. About like, yes, I get, yes. get everybody their favorite and nobody will waste their favorite because... Everyone wants to it is their favorite. They like, yeah, it's their mm-hmm. favorite. And so, in that essence, when we started to do that, all of a sudden the, the grocery bill started to get. It was more predictable because everybody knew the favorites. And when we would go for, when you would find the favorites on sale and you buy them in bulk, they would still not get wasted because they are the favorites and they always get consumed. And so. I've found oh, no, no, that, that, yeah, exactly. That's more management because thing. you're finding yeah. creative ways of, yeah, even me, I, I struggle with that. And, but I look at, I look at favorites, but I also look at necessity. Like you need to have a healthy diet, so you need to have yogurt. It is so I have a yogurt supplier. Sometimes it goes to waste, but sometimes when it reaches halfway, then I figure out ways to get it completed rather than it going to waste. So it's, it's sort of a management kind of thing rather than a minimization. And guess what? Everybody is happy. And when the favorites change, they communicate, like, because you're monitoring waste, you will not, and then you will know, but how come this is not, I don't like it anymore. Okay, mm. you cut it, and, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, and, and so, it's like, you, you are always identify, and, and everybody is free. It's like, you're free to change your, your preference and your choice. That's fine. We just now need to know what it is, because if we don't know, then then we will keep getting you the thing that you don't like. And we don't want that. Like, everybody loses. We need to come back to the win-win. So, just, yes. you know, I, I tell the children, you just keep us informed. Like, your favorite has changed. Great. Okay, we will update it. Uh, but you can't, yeah. you, you can't have things that you don't enjoy. Uh, mm-hmm. So, we have to get that aligned. And it, it's in the process of managing the waste that sort of like keeps us in that optimal space. Yeah. Because you're continuously monitoring it, monitoring you. I think that's the other thing, you know, where we started about passive income is it's not, it's not passive. You have to keep an eye. You have to keep working at it, refining it, improving it and saying, okay, now this, 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 this one has, you know, yeah. And not that everybody will get all the amounts they want because at times you even introduce a bit of scarcity so that, you know, say, okay, you wait next week. When they get it, they're, they're happy. Like, so also introducing some level of scarcity so that people are aware, oh, by the way, I will not always have that. You know, at times I have to go a day or two without it. And some of it is deliberate just to teach a lesson that, you know, it's not always abundance. Yeah. And, and yeah, so I, I think like we've really managed to bring back all those threads back together and touch them up <laughs> to the end. Uh, that that was yes. really really interesting and fascinating. How we we, we run around. I, I don't know if you have a few uh, final things to add to this before we, we wrap it up. No, I think thanks. I think thanks for having me. It's been. I mean, this is this is a very excellent uh, Saturday afternoon gig for me. I think I've enjoyed it a lot. I I sort of came in and said, you know what. We will spend like 10 minutes with, with, uh, with Clayton figuring out what we're going to talk about. And I'm glad we did. And, uh, you know, it's been enjoyable. I think, you know, talking about these things also helps us. Me as a, I tell people, I talk about what I know, what I like, what I'm thinking, because it helps me reinforce some of these things, even to myself. So even the, the you know, the discussion saying, huh, well, even when I'm listening to it, I'll say, hmm, 
So Stephen, you said this. So what are you going to do about it, and and things like that. So it is important to you know to to have these discussions because it helps us reinforce the principles, values, and so on as we look ahead. You know, in the rumble and tumble of life, at times we tend to forget. Yeah. So thank you so much, Stephen, for joining me today. And it was such a lovely time that we had. And I hope we can have more of these in the future. And I hope to see you around again. Thanks, Clayton. Talk to you soon.